Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what makes a good sous chef. Stay tuned. Before we get into it, let me give you a brief update. All the books are now translated into Spanish. And as of today, which is Sunday, August 27th, two of the books have been translated into Italian. So you can go find them. You can go to chefspsa.com forward slash books, and you can get all the books from Chef's PSA, Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, Kitchen Art of War, the two that are now in Italian, Line Cook Survival Manual, Bad Sue, Good Chef, and How Not to Be the Biggest Idiot in the Kitchen are now also in English, Spanish. The English versions are also ebook and audio. And we'll see if I do audio books on the different languages. That is undecided. So let me start out this episode with a joke. There's a group of chefs in a room at a party, and all of them are afraid to leave. They're all waiting each other out. And the reason that is because they know that the second that the first one leaves, the other ones are going to say, that chef is a shoemaker, that chef is a hack, their food sucks. It's an old joke, and it's probably been told a couple of different ways. And the reason I say that is because it's an old chef's PSA that I did, one of the original ones, is no matter how well you do something, another chef is going to think you're wrong. Today's episode is about what makes a good sous chef. There's going to be a lot of opinions on this. I did a podcast earlier in the series about going from cook to sous chef, where I talk about all the things that you need as a cook as you start moving up in your career, and what are the things that I would look for as a chef if I was going to promote someone to sous chef or hire someone for that matter. On this episode, what we're going to talk about is let's assume you're already in the position. How do you make sure that you're a good sous chef when you're in the position? And believe it or not, this is a very important skill. I often say that the price of entry, the gatekeeper is culinary ability. If you can't cook, you have no business being a sous chef. And I've said before, don't focus so much on the admin work. When you get into the sous chef role, you'll figure it out. It's probably not that complicated to write a schedule and things like that. But when you're in the role, there's going to be a lot of things that come at you for the first time. A lot of traps to avoid that a lot of sous chefs fall into. And I want to get into all those things. So some things to look out for and some things that will not only help you be more successful, but will save you a lot of headaches when you're in the position. Now, I think it needs to be said, the technical abilities are the gatekeeper. You need to know how to cook. If anything, you should be ideally the best cook in the kitchen, depending on what your brigade system is. So let's assume it's just you and the chef and you're in the second position. You're the number two. You need to be the best cook in the kitchen because most likely you're the one that's going to be doing most of the interacting with the majority of the cooks that work there. Not all kitchens are the same. And I should also say the, sh the sous chef duties in different kitchens are going to vary. So in some places I've been, I've been the chef of some places where the sous chef is basically the most experienced line cook, but you're tied down to a station. I've worked in other places where the sous chef is free from the station. They're running the pass and they're doing what most people think the chef does. So there isn't a one size fits all answer for what the sous chef's role and responsibility is. But let's just assume that you have some authority over your kitchen. In a lot of kitchens, the sous chef is like the varsity quarterback. People either love the sous chef because they're great. They're maybe they're not mean like the head chef. Sometimes they came up from the ranks from the line cook, so they still hang out and they're very friendly with them. Other times the sous chef is the biggest jerk. No one likes them. They're too strict. They think they're above everyone else. Those problems are usually the two that you come across, like the sous chef that's beloved or the sous chef that has a big ego. I should also say the third is the sous chef that doesn't do anything. As soon as the chef leaves, they, uh, they, they pull up a chair, sit down and, and bark orders. So those are usually the three different types of sous chefs that you're going to work with. The one that's going to be the most respectful in how they interact with others is usually the one that's going to be the most desired. So if you want to be a successful sous chef, first and foremost, you need to treat every single person in your kitchen with dignity and respect. That's going to go a very long way. If people respect you, they will do more for you. And I should also say they will respect you more if you have technical ability. So you need to be able to tell them to do it, but also demonstrate that you could do it. And if they're doing it incorrectly, you need to be able to correct them and show them how to do it. I've known certain sous chefs that don't know how to do something. And I've talked about this before, is that sometimes people will avoid certain jobs that maybe skipped over and now they're in a position of authority. So they're expected to know how to do this. 
and they don't want to lose face by showing that they don't know how to do it. So they just completely avoid it or they delegate it. People see through that. The rest of the team knows that if, if you avoid butchering the skate every single time, they're going to start to think they clearly don't know how to butcher skate. They always have to go to the restroom or take a call or place an order every time the skate comes out. Which, by the way, skate is an awesome fish. Skate wing needs to make a comeback. So if you're listening, you need to take the salmon off the menu and replace it with skate. Anyway, you don't have to do that. It's just my opinion. But a good sous chef has technical ability and can demonstrate that they can do the job as proficient as almost everyone on their team. Now, of course, there's going to be certain people on the team that could do specific tasks better than you. Like maybe someone is just really good at butchering fish. It's okay that they're better than you, but you still need to know how to do it. Maybe you can't do it as good as them, but you still need to be able to do it. Maybe someone is a better grill cook than you. They always nail the temps of the meat. Well, even if they are better than you, you still need to be able to do it. A good sous chef should be able to cover every single station in the kitchen with a certain level of proficiency. So let's just say you need to operate at an eight or a nine on all stations where some people might be operating at a 10. The other thing when you're new in the sous chef role is now you're starting to develop your communication skills. I was having coffee with someone today and we were talking about the difference between the different eras of kitchens. The old, in the old era, a lot of the era that I came up in, it was the chef would explode, yell at you multiple times over the same thing. But really, a lot of times the consequences for the action that was not desired was just yelling. But there was no correction. It was just, I'm going to explode, I'm going to yell, but I'm not going to correct it. I'm not going to explain it. And I'm also not going to fire you. When you manage that way, what ends up happening is sometimes not everyone responds well to that, especially nowadays. So it starts to create this downward spiral of mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. You make someone nervous because they mess this up. The next thing you know, they mess the next thing up and the next thing. And we were talking about, sometimes it's better to just stop, lower your voice, go up to them, explain to them why something needs to be done a certain way, how they can correct it and show them and then make sure that they understand. And then you show them again when the same thing happens and you show them a third time, but maybe by the fourth time you tell them, this just is not a good fit and they, and they move on. Every single step along the way is done respectfully because if you have a, a group of people watching and they see every interaction that you do is respectful and professionally and you educate them, they most likely will be more keen to learn the lesson. And if they understand that there's consequences, you know, the ultimate consequence of losing your job or some sort of demotion, then they will be more keen to correct it. However, if the only consequence is that you're going to yell and belittle and embarrass me, but you're not going to do anything, you're not going to fire me, you're not going to teach me how to do it, and you're not going to correct me, what's going to end up happening is people are just going to get used to you yelling at them, and that's it. They're not necessarily going to improve, and you're going to continue to get frustrated. So this is something that I talk to sous chefs often is like, when you become a sous chef, one of the most important things that you need to work on is how do you communicate ideas to people that they're going to learn from it, you're going to educate them, without making them feel like idiots. They could walk away from the interaction with you and say, now I understand. Now I know how to do that. Thank you for showing me. Maybe even thanking you and not walking away thinking that they want to quit or feeling like a failure, right? A good sous chef has the ability to communicate with people. And if they don't yet, that's going to be one of the most important skills that you need to add to your toolbox as a sous chef is that ability to communicate with others. To be able to communicate ideas without getting angry will help everyone in your kitchen out in the long run. The other thing that people expect from a sous chef is they have to walk the talk. I did a post the other day and I said, you have to walk the talk, but ultimately the walk is the only thing that matters. In other words, it doesn't matter if you say it, but if you do it, that's most important. You can't act as if Caesar is above the law. If the rule in the kitchen is no one does this, then it can't be no one does it except for the sous chef is allowed to get away with it. Because a rule for one is a rule for none, right? If one person could get away with it, then everyone's going to get away with it. And we all know what happens, right? We say, don't do this. And no one does it when the chef is there. But as soon as the chef leaves, everyone does it. So then the question is, is it really a rule? If a rule doesn't apply to everyone, then it's not a real rule. And the sous chef in my experience, I've seen many sous chefs fail with this. 
is they say one thing when the chef is around and as soon as the chef leaves, they do something completely different. And a lot of times that comes because they used to be friends with the cooks that are there. They want to be perceived as the cool person. Chef's not here, so we're going to do it this way. And I could tell you it's the wrong thing to do because people really don't respect that. And not only that, but the chef always knows because there's always someone that will rat you out to the chef and say, as soon as you leave, just so you know, this happened. Trust me, I was a chef for a long time. There's always spies in the kitchen that are always trying to gain a little advantage. The person that didn't get the job and you think they're your friend, they're, gonna, they're going behind your back. They're telling the chef this happens as soon as they leave. The other thing that the sous chef does that's a critical role in what they do is they act as the bridge between the culinary team, the line level staff, and the executive chef or the chef de cuisine. Because they live in both worlds. Sometimes they're, they're acting as a cook and other times they're acting as a leader. So they are shared information from both ends, meaning that the chef sometimes shares confidential information with them and sometimes the cooks share confidential information. Now I could tell you, and I'm only telling you from a chef's perspective because some of the cooks that might be listening to this will say, well, I don't like that at all. But when you hear something, you are the eyes and ears of the chef. And you need to be communicating that information up to the chef so that they can make a good decision on how to handle situations. So if you know of things happening, you need to make sure that you, left your, you let your chef know. But the other way around, unless we're talking about something like illegal or immoral or unethical, you're going to know things and it's your responsibility to not share that information down. So it's a tough situation because sometimes you got to tell people confidential information up that might get them in trouble, but sometimes you can't share that information that you know is going to affect the team down. That's the job that you signed up for. And trust me, it's one of the more difficult things that you're going to deal with because you're going to be sitting on your hands with some information. Maybe you know someone's about to be let go in a couple of days, but you can't say anything about it. Maybe that someone is your friend and you can't say anything about it. Maybe you know someone's going to quit and you know it's going to screw over the entire restaurant and this person is your friend, but you still have a duty because you took the job to be the sous chef. And ultimately your duty and your loyalty lies to the restaurant and to the chef that you're working for. It's a tough thing for people to navigate. There's going to be situations that come up where in a lot of kitchens, the sous chef or the number two is really the person that's driving the cuisine forward. And in many cases, they might be technically stronger than the chef that they work for, meaning with food, pots, pans, knives, things like that. They might be more efficient on the line. Or maybe they put more dishes on the menu recently or whatever the case may be. These instances are going to happen. And you're going to have this feeling that you may be slightly upset and think that you deserve more of the glory, more of the lion's share of the glory than the chef is getting. And you got to be careful with that. You should go back and listen to my series that I did on the 48 Laws of Power as it relates to chefs. And rule number one is never outshine the king. Even if... You are technically better at certain things than the chef. Make sure that they give the credit. It's your job as the sous chef. This is kind of weird, but this is the reality. It's your job as the sous chef to make sure that the chef looks good. And it's the chef's job to make sure they give you the credit when you deserve it. That's the way it works. And if you work for a good chef, hopefully they're giving you the credit when you deserve it. But it's really easy to be upset with the chef because you feel like you're not getting the credit that you deserve and you do something stupid behind their back and you try and sabotage them or you talk bad about them when they're not in the room and you plant the seed of dissension amongst the team. Trust me, you do not want to do that. That's a slippery slope to losing a job and to burning a bridge. Always make sure the chef looks good. Enhance their reputation whenever possible. Never outshine the chef. Let them have the limelight. Your time will come, trust me. And your time will come sooner if you make sure that your boss always looks good. And they recognize that. The chef knows. Hopefully the chef that you work for has some common sense. They know that you're doing all the work. And when your time comes, if you have a good relationship with your chef, they're going to make sure that you get your turn at bat. Another really good trait of the sous chef is that they solve problems quickly and they get the chef involved when they cannot solve the problem. I used to tell my chefs, if I would go home and something would happen, I would want to know about it. It didn't matter. Send me a text, give me a phone call, whatever the case may be. I want to know about it. So... I'm able to fix it and get ahead of it, or I'm able to think about how I'm going to correct it before I walk in the door. 
but there's nothing worse than walking through the door and finding out there's a disaster and all these things happened and you're finding out about it a little bit too late and now you can't correct it. To each their own. Not all chefs think this way. Some, some chefs are like, it's my day off. Don't bother me. I was the opposite. If there was a big issue, I want to know about it before I walk in the door. If it's a big issue, and I should put that in quote, because if it's a little issue, I don't want to know about it. You're put in a position of leadership, so you're expected to take charge. As the expression goes, if you're not sure what the right thing to do is, do the right thing. And if you find yourself in a position where you don't know what to do, then you could ask. A good, a good rule of thumb is what would the chef do in this situation? What do you think is the best move in this situation? And if you're uncertain, ask the chef. And if you can't get a hold of the chef, make the decision that you think they would make. And if you're not sure what they would do, do the right thing. I don't know if I've ever said this before, but I'll say it here. Maybe I said it in a book or another podcast. But the person that brings the most value to the team is the person who could solve one issue versus the person who could point out 10 problems. So I'll say that another way. If you could solve one problem, you bring more value than the person that could find 10 problems. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of chefs that I've worked with, sous chefs and whatnot, that all they do is complain. This is wrong. This is wrong. We can't do this because of that. We can't do this because of that. And they have nothing but excuses as to why things can't get done. Everywhere they look, they see an obstacle to not perform. And as the chef, I can tell you that's frustrating because usually when you're in the chef position, you've usually skipped the step of sous chef by solving problems. And so the person that has more value is the person that could solve problems versus the person that could find problems. If you could solve me one problem, you have more value than the other person. Because that means you're wired differently. You're wired to fix things and find solutions. And when you're a sous chef, your job is to handle the issues. You should be handling the majority of the issues on your own without having to get the chef involved. But you should be getting the chef involved when you reach something that you cannot solve on your own. But if you take more off the chef's plate, it's a good thing. And if they give you more, that's also a good thing. So a lot of people look at it as like, they're giving me more work. I can't handle it. It's too much. If you truly can't handle it, ask for help. But if you can handle it, you should take it, thankfully. Because if they're giving you more work, it usually means that they have more confidence in you. Now, a lot of people don't agree with my, what I'm going to say next. But occasionally people will ask me like, hey, I feel like I'm doing the executive chef's job, but I'm not getting paid for it. What should I do? I always say do it get the experience, learn how to do it. Because when the time comes, people are not stupid. If people are noticing that you're doing the work of the person above you, one of two things, it's either happening because they're grooming you and getting you ready to go into that position. And they want to, they want you to demonstrate it first before they give it to you. Or they are aware that it's happening and maybe they're about to let someone go and move you into the position. So when you're given things that are, you know, sometimes above your pay grade, Look at it as an opportunity to learn, because I'm going to give you this example. You have two sous chefs. You give both of them a little bit more work than what they're used to. One person says, I'm not doing it unless you pay me because that's not my job. And the other person says, I'll do it regardless. The person who says they'll do it regardless, when the time comes, will get promoted. It's really a no brainer. It's obvious because they've already demonstrated that they are willing to go above. And they've already demonstrated a competency in the task where the other person, like it's a gamble. One, they might not be able to do it. It's just theory that they say they could do it, but the other person has demonstrated it. Take the opportunity when the time arises. I'm going to tell you a story. I had a, a sous chef that worked for me and then she had gone and worked in this three Michelin star restaurant. And then she came back and worked for me later on. And I had made something and then I had stepped away. And when I stepped away, she went and changed it because she thought it would be better the way that she wanted to make it. And she told someone, I corrected Andre's dish. I know better now. I just came back from this restaurant. And it got back to me. And even though this person didn't think that they were doing anything wrong, it was, I, I took it very personally. It's like the dish that I was doing was sentimental to me. I was replicating a dish a very specific way because that's the way I wanted it. And this person thought, well, they knew better because they had just come from this restaurant and then made a joke about it to the staff that they were correcting me. 
And I could tell you, like, that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. You lose complete trust with your chef when that happens. Don't be the sous chef that does it differently as soon as the chef walks out the door. You need to be speaking with one voice. You need to be aligned. You and your executive chef need to be aligned in your actions, even when you don't agree. If you don't agree, speak up. And if they say, I've heard you, but we're still doing it this way, then that's what it is. But don't do it a different way as soon as they walk out of the room. And if it's a recipe that they told you to do and the recipe doesn't work, don't be the person that says, okay, chef's gone, do it this way. Go back to the chef and say, hey, I followed your recipe and this is the result. Is this what you want? And if that's not what you want, can you show me? Because maybe I'm doing something wrong. Because a lot of times, like I've been in situations where people say, oh, chef's recipe doesn't work, do it this way. It's like my recipe does work. And then I go look at the recipe and there was a typo. And all they had to do is tell me and I would have corrected it. It's not that my recipe didn't work. Well, technically it didn't. But if I could have caught the typo and made sure that the recipe worked versus them going around telling everyone chef's recipe didn't work and making me look bad, but really making them look bad because they're making me look bad to the staff, but they look bad to me. And also the staff now knows that the two chefs are not aligned. And I can tell you, one of the most important things for me as a chef is I need that number two. I need the sous chef to be my right hand. We need to be both going the same direction because I don't want someone on my team that's rowing against me. There's going to be times when you make mistakes as the sous chef. I can tell you, it's best to be honest and upfront. One of the things that I used to do whenever I'd make a mistake, I would show up and confess. Be like, chef, I did this, but this is what I did to fix it. Versus them finding out later. You want to own up to it. You don't want to hide your mistakes because it always comes up. And you also don't want to hide the mistakes of others. Like, unless you can correct it, you need to be upfront and communicate what those mistakes are. But like I said, the best answer is always, this is wrong. This is what I did to fix it. That's the kind of person you want on your team. Someone that's solutions-based. A quick update can save you hours worth of work. So a simple, hey, this is what happened. And maybe the chef has a solution. Boom, do this. And one of the last things when it comes to working together as a chef is you start to pick up a certain cadence, especially when you work in tight spaces. It's like the doctor and the assistant are like scalpel, scalpel, and they're passing them, you know, the tools on the tray. When I would work with a lot of sous chefs, especially ones that I had worked with for a long time, we had a certain flow. Like they knew exactly when I needed a spoon and they were handing it to me before I need it, or they're passing me a small container of whatever, so I could put a canal of whatever. That's the kind of person that you want to work with, where you guys are in flow. You both are in flow. You're handing them things. They're handing you things and the food just comes out perfect. They're wiping the rim of the plate while you're putting the finishing touch or vice versa. There's a certain rhythm. And I could tell you that if, if you could work in that flow with your chef, it's a very beautiful thing. And I want to work with those people because sometimes it's the exact opposite. You're bumping into each other. One person thinks they're, one person's trying to take control and the other person doesn't want to follow. And, it, and it's just awkward. You need to have a, there's a certain kitchen karate going between the sous chef and the chef to make sure that everything goes out smooth. That's what you're looking for. So to recap, it's about being able to solve problems and asking for help when you can't. It's about making sure your chef looks good and then making sure that you look good as well. It's about being able to flow together. It's about making sure that you're the voice of reason and that you're upholding the rules of the kitchen even when the chef leaves. And sometimes it's about taking on more work so you can learn and grow. Anyway. Hope you enjoyed that episode. I hope you learned a couple of things. If you want to support the show, you know what to do. Or if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe. If you're listening on Spotify or some other platform, make sure you leave five stars. Nothing less than five stars. Five-star podcast. If you've purchased the books before and you like them, please leave a review on Amazon or Audible. The reviews go a long way. And only five-star reviews. If, if you didn't like the book, then you know, just I'd rather you tell me you didn't like it than tell the world. Just kidding. Only five-star reviews on the book, though. Go to chefspsa.com for everything that we're doing. Thank you very much. See you next week. Cue the porno music.